Pilgrim Tabernacle. It's my prayer. Uh, I am certainly happy this morning to see the spiritual inclining of this tabernacle and how that uh, the sign out there, they're fixing now to build a new church. I think it's needed. And um, see, the, after, if the Lord Jesus tarries after we are gone, they'll have, our children will have to have a place to go to church, and we want to earnestly contend for the faith that was once uh, delivered unto the saints. I think that's a good thing. And as I was just coming in a few moments ago to add with many of the testimonies that's already been given concerning healings of the last few meetings at the tabernacle here, they just constantly pile up of healings, great miraculous healings. I'd left my wife out just now and children at the, the door and... There was a sister sitting present now, just so thrilled as she was crying of a great miracle had taken place on her little grandson, way down, I suppose, in Chattanooga, Um, Mrs. Nash here. Her little grandson was afflicted with an affliction, and the last meeting here, the Lord Jesus, I think, called it out and said, Thus saith the Lord that... It's gone, and he's going to be well. And the little lad is perfectly normal and well, just as well as he can be. And it's it's thrilling to hear those testimonies. And then a young fellow, which is also present, asked a prayer for Mrs. Stotts. It's uh, just uh, undergone an operation, and their interest. See, if nobody wants us to pray for them while they're... It shows as long as you're trying, people wanting you to pray for them, there's an interest, you see. Sometimes it gets so awful to, not awful, but so many that you just have to run out somewhere and stick your head away and hide for a little bit to live. But I'm glad they do that. Don't ever think that I don't like to see them because if if there was no one more to me to pray for them, where would my ministry be? Amen. See? But... Sometimes when you say, Brother Branham, I don't understand when people calling like that and, and you'll slip out somewhere. I have to do that in order to live, to pray for the people. You just don't, it isn't this just one place here, it's all over the world, you see. And, and it's really rough. And I'm sure that you understand that. Amen. Oh, it's so good to be a Christian. Praise I just God. don't yeah, know what I would do if it wasn't for Christ. Amen. And... So, and to have the association with Christians, that uh, per, people of like precious faith, who believe in God and are trusting Him, and believing at some glorious day we'll be over all this battle and have the victory and stand redeemed in His likeness on the other side. Amen. And uh, then I would uh, like to make just a brief announcement <coughs> that in the coming of the tabernacle and so forth, I, we're making a renewment of our foundation, especially my part for the campaigns. All down along through the meeting, since I started in this, uh, on the evangelistic side, many years ago, instead of forming a foundation to have another group of people, I just used the group that I was acquainted with. And uh, from uh, and made a foundation that all of my meetings would be carried under the name of the Branham Tabernacle, and that would be used at the Union National Bank in New Albany as where funds could be pay, paid through that. That it would not be taxable if I didn't. All the money that was taken up would be taxable to me if I didn't use the Branham Tabernacle as a foundation. Many of you have heard me announce that time after time. I have to do it and to, in order to do that. And then, uh, and then we're setting up a new foundation now. And uh, we'd like as many as knows that I... How many have ever heard me announce that at all? Munerations, I work through the Branham Tabernacle. Just raise up your hands, all sure, all of you. It's all out. And uh, when the service is over, if you will, I've got a little statement there. So that you, if you'd sign it as you go out, Brother Roy Roberson will have it back there. Of course, we're going to set up another foundation 
Uh, same thing, just uh, but another foundation that all of our funds and things is taken up in the meeting, keeping being taxed, will be is placed as usual in the Union National Bank to be operate through the tabernacle instead of having a, a found, another foundation because this is already a foundation in the name of the Branham Tabernacle, you see. And so these are Branham here and a Branham there and like this and different foundations that don't go too good. Brother Roberson will take care of that. You that will, as we go out, we appreciate it. Now, this morning, before we enter into the service, I'd like to say the Lord willing that I'll try to be back again tonight. I hate to take both meetings from Brother Neville, but he so generously asked me to speak again tonight. And if the Lord willing, I want to speak tonight on an evangelistic subject of title this, Who Is This? Amen. Who Is This? And um, so this morning I want to, I was thinking of, of speaking this morning on a Mother Day subject, and I know that this afternoon and the morning's all been filled with Mother Day programs, so I thought I would kind of combine something because we want to pray for the sick immediately after this service is over. And uh, as usual, we believe that God is a healer, and He heals the sick and the afflicted. And I know He does that, and it's beyond any... Any doubts that, because there's too many testimonies piled up, but we know that yesterday I was looking in a sack that uh, Brother Gene and Leo had just kept of testimonies that they picked up. And it was a great sack full of outstanding, miraculous healings that the Lord has did for the people. And I thought, if that would be so, what if we kept account of all that had taken place? I guess in Puerto Rico... And Jamaica alone would have run 10,000 or better outstanding testimonies of healings of the Lord that he did. Now, before we open the book, let's speak to the author. Lord, we are so grateful to you that it's when we bow our heads, we just stammer for words to say. For I do not believe that it lays in the human lips to express the feelings of the heart of a man or woman, boy or girl that's ever been in contact with thee. To express our adorations of how we adore you. And what you mean to us. It separated us from sin and it separated us from the world. And it give us something that's eternal and blessed. Amen. And we could not find words sufficiently. As it was once said by a noble man a few weeks ago, that he could speak fluidly in about nine different languages, holding his position with the advisor to our lovely president, Dwight Eisenhower. And although able to speak nine languages fluidly, he said when he received the Holy Spirit, he tried every nine and there was no words that he could find. Nothing he could express. And so you gave him a new language to express and to thank you with. And we feel that way too, Lord, that when life is over... Maybe we'll talk all together in a different language so we can express what we think about you. Amen. Yeah. Now we would ask, Lord, that you would bless this tabernacle, oh, yeah. its pastor, its trustees, its Amen. deacons, all of its associates, yeah. the people who visit here, come in and out the doors. May it be found always as dedicated a haven of rest. Where the weary can come in of its doors and find rest and peace to their soul. And that the sick might come in the door and go out well because of the ever-living presence of the Almighty God who dwells under its roof. 
We would ask, Lord, that in this coming program of us being a farm now, that you would meet with the boar and meet with all. And if it so pleases you that there would be a continual commemoration of the prayer that was prayed in this old pond and a weed patch one day, that now it's become a lighthouse, a haven of rest for the weary because of the answer of that prayer. Now forgive us of anything that we have did or said or thought that was contrary to your great will. And remember, Lord, it did not come from our hearts. We only might have expressed it in our action or in our lips. But quickly thou did hear us when we seemed we were wrong. We were willing to confess it. And we do not want to hold in our heart iniquity. Then we know that God will not answer our prayers, but constantly confessing our errors. And we'd ask, Lord, that you would bless this morning all across the nation as it's celebrating this Memorial Day of Mother's Day. But may this not just be a, a Mother's Day. May every day be so. God grant this morning that mothers, women, who are wandered away from God, that they will come to themselves this morning and will recognize that what the word mother means, one who has begotten, may she realize that the offsprings from her union with her husband has been sacred little gems that God has placed under her care. Then God will hold her responsible for the rearing of those children. And as the scripture says that the good woman and the mother, what she is, that her children will call her blessed. Oh Lord, when we see this day when they get so far away from the Scriptures and act as almost as beasts. We pray, God, that you give us an old-fashioned revival that will call them back to the place where they should be. Lord, we would not by no means forget to thank you for real mothers. For we know that we have such living today Real, genuine mothers. God bless them. They are great treasures to us. And we pray that you will continue to be with them, Lord. And may they live happy and see the fruit of their wounds serving God. Amen. And we pray, God, that those who wear the white rose this morning or the white flower to say that their mother has passed beyond this scene of action today. May, Lord God, they rest in peace and their labors follow them. Grant it, Lord. Now take thy word, Lord, and speak to the people and give them comfort. For that is why we have gathered here to feel your presence, hear your word, and be blessed and leave here to be better men and women, boys and girls, than we were when we entered. We ask this in the name of Jesus, God's Son. Amen. I love the reading of his blessed word. So now we shall turn this morning in the book of 1 Corinthians and read for a portion of the 15th chapter. 
beginning with the first verse, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory that I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You might say, Brother Branham, that's rather an unusual text for a Mother's Day message. Well, that's true. But, you know, God's unusual. And He does things in an unusual way. And I think the thoughts of Mother, and I have one this morning by the grace of God still here on earth with us, And I'm grateful for Mother. But being that we were to have also a healing service and not knowing that I would be back again tonight, but I thought maybe that we could paint a different type of a picture. Mother is so great. You know, the first one that receives you is, this life is your mother. No one can touch you because you're conceived. And she bears you under her heart. And she is the first to know you and the first to, in this life to, to hold you. Then when you're born, she is a, one of the first hands that touch you and wipes back the tears out of your eyes. She's the first one to pat you and to love you and to coo over you in this life is your mother. Now I think that there is not enough honor that we could give to a mother. Mother is first with the child and she's a great responsibility of what that child will be will be based upon the way that mother starts that child on the path that it must travel mother has the responsibility from God to place that child on the right road and I think that's why mothers has a special little touch. I know of a boy in this city, I think his mother's present now. He's almost my age. But I don't say this to hurt the mother because that she has enough hurts, as all mothers. But the boy drinks, and he drinks heavy. And when he gets real drunk, he'll come home and jump in the bed with his mother and put his arms around her, and he's got grandchildren. But there's something about just the pat of a mother that seems to take a a different place than anything else can touch. That is, in this life, humanly speaking. You know, a man like Moses, he, if I could credit anything to his character, it was because he had a God-sent mother 
You know, it was she that had prayed Josephel and it longed for this baby. And when he was born, she was the one who cooed him and cuddled him and built the ark and placed him in the bulrushes when her poor heart breaking. Her only little baby in it was a the most outstanding little chump that was in all the world. And how a mother likes any baby. But to see this special little fella. And then in her heart she knew that he was born for a purpose. And then to take him and place him into the very den of crocodiles out into the river. By faith she did that knowing that God was able to take care of him. And to summonize the love of a mother and the action of the character of her faith. For faith does not place itself upon the shifting sands of what it can see. Faith rests solemnly upon the unmovable rock of God's eternal word. Amen. For by faith, says the scripture, she did this. And faith can take its stand on the rock that the waves are beating the foundations out and look straight into the face of death. And know that it'll be just in a little bit. But faith can look across the sea to him that said, I am the resurrection in life. Amen. And fail to even hear the waves of dashing. That's the kind of faith that Moses' mother had. She taught him and she reared him in the palace of Pharaoh. Teaching him that he was born for a purpose that Jehovah had answered her prayer. And she, he could not have had a better teacher. That's what helped mold the character that Moses was. I believe it was Abraham Lincoln who once made a statement like this. Now, I'm neither Democrat or Republican. I just... I'm a Christian. For I think one side could not say uh, anything against the other side. It's all corruption. But Abraham Lincoln to my thoughts was one of the, it was one of the greatest presidents that this United States ever had, including Washington and so forth. For Abraham Lincoln had a, a bad start. He was poor. He had no background as far as education or, or some great something or money or something that could have helped him like Washington did. Washington was a college graduate and he, he, know, he was a smart man. A great man to begin with. But Lincoln was raised in a little log cabin under the great grounds of Kentucky. And with no glory in the little old cabin which sets as a memorial here at Louisville now. But being the great man that he was and had to learn to write upon uh, the ground that he plowed to plant the corn. But I might pass this on to the young people. Do you know Abraham Lincoln never owned a book in his life until he was after 21 years old but the Bible and the Fox Book of the Martyrs. See, what you read molds the character that you are. 
No wonder we got a bunch of neurotics today. It's little old fiction magazines and vulgar and nonsense is placed upon our newsstands. He owned the Bible and the Fox Book of the Martyrs. Look what it made him. But in the face of all that, one day he made a statement like this. He said, if there could be any good thing found in me, it's because of a godly mother that reared him to serve the Lord. You see, a child listens to its mother. Some little touch about that mother that a child will listen to. When it's hurt, it'll go to the mother for consolation before it'll go to the father. Because she was first with it, you know. And there's some gift that God gives a mother to be that way. I mean a real mother. Now, I believe that mothers are honorable and godly, but I believe such as mother days like this is a racket. Make a lot of money out of flowers and things. But Mother's Day should be every day. Not to send her a bunch of flowers on Mother's Day, but to love her and care for her 365 days and nights through the year. But, of course, the commercial world has a great hold in things like this. And it, 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 it depreciates Mother. Oh, well, last Mother's Day I sent her a bunch of flowers. She'd appreciate a whole lot more just sit down and talk to her just a little bit. Write her a line. Pat her on the shoulder. Kiss her on the cheek. Tell her you love her. It'll go a lot farther than all the flowers that you could buy from the floors. That's true. I believe it was in the Ten Commandments, the late Cecil DeMille, that wrote and put on the screen one of the masterpieces of the movie world. And before it was put on the scene or let out, Cecil DeMille called old Roberts and Demas Sicari and a bunch of the full gospel ministers and took them into his own studios. And showed the four hours of the Ten Commandments and asked them their opinion of it. God rest his gallant soul. I when I seen it, was looking at it, an old remark always stuck to me. If many of you who did see it, it was when the daughter of Pharaoh after Moses had found out that he was a, a Hebrew. And he had decided to go dwell with his people. And there sat his once beautiful mother faded out with her gray hair and her wrinkled face sitting in an old armchair, typical mother. And the Pharaoh's daughter came in. And he said, Whose son am I anyhow? And when it was brought to light that Josie Bell was his real mother, the daughter of Pharaoh with her paint and so forth and all fixed up, she said, but look, he may be your son, but she said, I give him wealth and splendor. You could have given him nothing but the slime pits. But the aged, gray-headed mother said, but I give him life. That makes a difference. I gave him life. God gave him eternal life. How true, Mother. 
Sometimes people say to me, mostly always in my campaigns, I'm constantly preaching up on the resurrection. And I read a text this morning, a 15th chapter and a 4th verse of First Corinthians on the resurrection. But you see, the way they place mother today is a pot of flowers sitting by an old lady who's old and can't get up maybe and feeble and gray-headed and wrinkled and sitting in an armchair. That's true enough. But I want to take my theme and paint you another picture of what mother is. Someone said you preach too much on the resurrection. Most every message has got something about the resurrection. Why, sure. It's the, it's the cardinal resting place of the gospel. No matter what he did, if he did not rise again from the dead, then all of it was in vain. It to me proves that he was God. Proves every claim he made. The resurrection. And it also is the place of the resting of the soul. It's the starting part. It's the crowning of our consolation. And when we see that He rose from the dead. It places us with the gospel armor at the battle front to take the place to fight. For we know, He said, He that will lose his life for my sake shall find it again. Now I think it's the great Carnation of the full gospel is the resurrection and its divine promises and the consolation that it gives those who are trusting in it. For it promises the great union of our uniting together again. It promises the the fading away of all sin. It promises the fading away of all deformities. All the sufferings that we have did in this, had to go through with in this life, it promises the banishing of us all. It promises that even death will lose its hope and we'll rise in the likeness of Jesus. So in my opinion, the resurrection is the greatest of all the promises in the things of the Scripture. There's where it sealed it. In the last Easter when I was preaching on the five things of living, He loved me, dying, He saved me, buried, He carried my sins far away, but rising, He justified. Freely forever. That's the day for me. That great day of days. To see what it will mean to all of us in the resurrection as we labor and wait for that blessed day of days. It gives us the promise that someday that these old weakening, feeble, gray-headed, broke-down mothers will be changed. Not only will mother sit there by herself, but all of her family with her. And what a day that will be. What a time it will be. When we look upon the faces of those who we have loved so well. What a difference on that morning when we shall see our loved ones and 
And so what, what they'll be then, all the afflictions will be taken away. All the miles of suffering will be done. No more pale cheeks of death. No more tears from the eyes. The resurrection promises all of this. There'll be no more funerals. No more patting the baby on the cheek that's like a piece of stone where the undertaker has embalmed and pushed out and put paint on and so forth to look natural. It'll never be needed again there. Then I think of when we see them standing yonder, our loved ones, our mothers, our kindred, our, our friends, and to see them in their immortal bodies, their celestial bodies, watching their character, seeing how they conduct themselves with that sweetness and quietness, no more nervousness or frustrations. To see him in standing in the likeness of the Lord Jesus. That'll be a wonderful day. And each one of us in our minds are anticipating and longing for that hour of consolation when we meet them. Each one is thinking of their loved one, maybe their mother that's gone on. What a day it'll be when you see her again. And to dad and to brother and to the, all the loved ones, what a day it will be. I'm thinking too right now. I'm thinking of my family. What it will mean for me at that day. I'm thinking that on that resurrection morning, perhaps the first one who'll come to meet me will be my little Sharon. No, she won't be shaking. That devil came into that place. No meningitis can ever touch that land. Hallelujah. She won't be waving goodbye to me. Those little blue eyes will be dancing as she throws her arms forth and screams, Daddy. Hey, man. I'll be glad to see her. Hey. To know she'll never die again. Praise to know that it's all over. Why I preach resurrection so hard? Then I'll see her mother. The mother of Billy, my boy. And I have lots of memories right there that linger on. I remember when I was taking her up, our Mr. Combs up here was taking her to the last ride, and I was following her in a car. As we went down 7th Street right there, Billy, 18 months old, how that they had bring him out to the street and let her see him. She'd lay and weep and look at her baby. But she couldn't get near him. And then on the road down, the undertaker come along and went down the, the, the seven street. Mama here was taking care of him at the time. And he was standing out in the yard with a little bitty pair of short pants. And a little red cap pulled sideways on his head. And when that mother laying on that cop in the back of that ambulance watching me when she's seen her baby standing in the yard knowing she's taking her final ride, she raised from the cop and screamed and threw out her bony hands to embrace her baby in the yard. But she couldn't have him. Oh, it'll be a joy to see her on that day. Hallelujah. No, she won't have bony hands. 
neither will their cheeks be sunk in, but she'll stand in the celestial beauty of a queen of heaven, her mother. Her black eyes, as black as raven's wings, will be dancing with joy. She won't be all stooped over where that devil of TB will never enter that land. But immortal will stand in his likeness. I suppose then next coming to meet me will be Edward, who we called Humpy for a short name. He was the first of the big nine link chain, chain of the Branham family. He was the first link to break the one next to me. I'll see Edward come running to me. Yet he died as a boy, 19 years old. And when I take him by his hand, I'm sure we'll have lots of things to talk about. A boyhood. Because we were chums. We stuck together. He let me wear his suit and, and, and things like real brothers did. I, it'll be a pleasure to see him again. Now hear him say something like this. Did you get my word, Bill? You were working on a cattle ranch at the time of my going from the earth. But in the hospital I said, word back, tell Bill everything's all right. I'll be glad to say yes. I got your word out on the prairie. Amen. Then I suppose next will come my dad. He was the next link to go. No, I think Charles is the next link. A younger brother. He had an automobile accident when just a little boy. He always drug his right leg as he walked. But you know what I see him? He won't be dragging that leg. It'll be all done away with. He'll stand in the splendor of a young man. Amen. And he'll say to me something like this as he smiles. he say, yes, Bill, there's no accidents up here. And I remember the night before I was taken in the automobile accident. You talked to me standing in the little archway of our little humble home that I'm looking on the top of right now. You talked to me about the Lord. Just a few hours before going and you were in the pulpit preaching when I left. Then will come Dad. Oh, I can see. Though he give me many hard whippings, just exactly what I needed. But I'll see that shock of black wavy hair more brilliant than ever that day. Amen. And he'll look at me and say, My boy, you know, Daddy will never get up from the table here any more hungry to let his children eat. For here we have plenty. There's never a want here. To see him when he would work and at 50 or 75 cents a day and then get up from the table so the children could eat. Go back to work again. He worked so hard till his shirt would sunburn to his back and Mom would cut it loose with the scissors. I'll hear him say something like this. Bill, do you remember that night you and Brother George come to pray for me when I was going? You know, I told Mama that there were two white angels standing at the bed and a red angel at the foot. And the red angel was trying to get me. But the white angel stood between they finally packed me home. Then also the next in the link to go, or did go, will come Howard. I'll see Howard as we chum together across the lands everywhere. Called to be a minister, great personality. 
but his associates kept him back. The last talk that I had with him, he said, when I go, Bill, I, I saw him going by vision about four years before he went. Told him I seen Pop mark his grave and say that was the next. And he said, there's one thing I want you to do for me. He said, I've muddled up my life. I've been married and everything. I, I don't know what's happened. I said, do you believe him, Howard? He said, with all that's in me, I believe him. And about two or three days before he left, he made his peace with God, with Amen. Brother Neville and them there. Amen. And he said, there's one thing I want you to do. When I go, Bill, have him to sing for me, he'll understand and say, well done. Amen. I believe before I shake Howard's hand, I'll hear him stop and look at me and say, Bill, he understood. After that will come Brother Seward, Brother Frank Broy, Brother George Diart. Oh, the resurrection means a lot to me. I'm anticipating on that great crowning hour. And as the light begins to spread, we'll know as we're known. We'll understand and, and we'll remember our acquaintance and the, the ones that's been there. And, and many there'll be many there that we didn't even think would be there. For you know, it's at that time that I believe that the bread that we have cast upon the human troubled waters will return to us on that day. When we see the effects of our testimony on people that we didn't understand their action towards it will probably be there. What a day that will be. And then also the seeds that we sowed, not even thinking at what they would do, but here they are. They brought forth precious fruits and we'll see them on that day. The wayward loved ones and relatives now think of the thousands that I've seen converted, yes, into the millions now going, and what their ministry was. Oh, it'll take more than a resurrection. It'll take up eternity to go around shaking hands and finding out things that I don't know now. There will be those old gray-headed mothers that you're wearing those white flowers for today. They'll see you and they'll be beautiful. Not represented by a pot of flowers or some picture of an old gray-headed person, but in the likeness and beauty of the resurrection, they'll stand in the likeness of Christ. Their celestial bodies, young and beautiful forever. Sure, that's the, re- that's the Mother's Day that I'm waiting for. That's the carnation. Not the carnation on the lapel, but the carnation of the soul. For God has changed her. As I think of my old mother, old and feeble and shaking with palsy, she'll not be doing that that day. It'll be different, man. That great light begins to spread. All, as we begin to look around, and the great circle will be getting greater and greater and greater. It's all just reflecting the approach of Jesus. And after a while, as the song says, and I shall see Jesus at last. Amen. He will be waiting for me. Jesus so kind and true. On His beautiful throne, He'll welcome me home after this day is through. And as we see Him, and we will not be as we are now. We'll, we'll know how to love Him more. We'll not stand back with a little fear because we'll be like Him. 
Well, he'll be more of a relative to us than he is now. We'll understand him better because we're so far away in the mortal bodies than we'll have a body like his glorious body. We'll know how to worship him. And when we see what the presence of his being has done to us, changed us, the old back young, all the deformed straightened out, all we'll understand then why his power healed us. The questions that's been in our minds. How can He do it? What would this? Somehow, mysteriously, it'll all fade away. The knots that's been tied in the back of our minds. Will it be this? How could it be? Somehow, another majestic fingers will just untangle, unravel those knots and it'll all fade into the one big crown of love. Then we shall see Him. Then we shall be like Him. Then we shall worship Him. Then we shall see Mother as God wants her. Mother would not be complete there without her family. Because the greatest time of all of her life is to see the children around the table and all of them healthy and happy and, and, and to see her pour the coffee or whatever she does and fix the supper and her and Dad sit down. Well, that's the happiest time of Mama's life. See her kiddies all at home. Now, don't be, don't be missing that day. Let the great chain of your family be hooked together link by link. Let every spoke be in the wheel. And then when we sit down with our families in groups across the canopies of eternity, what a day that will be. Amen. Then we'll understand. It was Him who promised this in Revelation 1, where it said that a sharp two-edged sword went out of his mouth. It was called the Word of God. And it was from that same lips it said, I am he that is alive, that was dead, and I'm alive forevermore. From those same lips in St. John 6.30, it says this, that I'll lose nothing but I'll raise it up again at the last days. It was Him that made the promise. Those same precious lips. He's the one who saves us, who heals us, who redeemed us, and who will raise us up at the last day. If you are that little weak link that has separated this great family reunion at that day, May the God of heaven this morning somehow in a mysterious way unravel those little knots that's tied in your mind and reveal to you the love that He has for you. May you come sweetly to serve Him. While we think on these things, let us pray. Just before we pray and you have your heads bowed, I'm going to ask you, would you like to, on this Mother's Day, to rededicate your lives anew to Him, looking forward for that resurrection? Would you raise your hands to Him while everyone, God bless you. Would there be a sinner who's present now would say, Oh God, I've not yet hooked myself into that link. I am the missing one that would be not there when Mother goes to looking around through glory. I'll not be there. For I've never yet made my peace with God. I have not the hope of eternal life in me. But today I, I want to do that. Would you raise your hand and say, Pray for me, Brother Branham, at this time. I want to be remembered in prayer. For I have loved ones across the sea the sea of life, and I want to meet them. Raise your hands. Or someone who's backslid and would want to come back on this day and say, Lord, I'll reconsecrate myself again to you, coming to renew my covenant with you. Would you raise your hands? Our Heavenly Father, as it is drawing, this day will make one day closer to that great event. 
And we have just been forced each year to see this represented. As the people used to go up to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and for the cleansing of the tabernacle and the sanctuary and, and the offering of the sin offering, each year they was reminded when that lamb died out there that there would come a time that the lamb of God would die to divorce sin. Each time that little fellow bladed and the blood sprinkled over their hands, they was reminded that there would be a time when there would be the Lamb of God. They would cry, Lama, a Lama. At the cross, I pray, God, that as we look today and see that a few weeks ago before leaving in your service for California, this Indiana laid bare and dead and there was no life seemingly the flowers that died last fall, the leaves that had gone off the trees and the sap in the trees had gone to the roots and everything was dead. But there was a season when the sun began to shine in a different way. The same sun that had shined through the winter, but the elements had changed. And it shined differently. And by the shining of the sun with the elements, life sprung up everywhere. The leaves come back to the trees. The, leaf, the life that had left the leaf, and the leaf dropped off, but the life went in the ground. It came back in new beauty, in the splendor of youth. The flower that had given up its, its fragrance, that had given up its radiant beauty, and had fallen into the earth, born, burst forth again in its youth with a new fragrance. What are we reminded of, Lord, at these hours? And the world we come from a bleak, bladed desert unto a paradise of beauty and the bees and the birds singing and everything lighthearted in the trees of, of frolicking in the winds of the warm spring breeze. Warmth and joy was on the earth again because of the sun. S-U-N. But someday the S-O-N is coming with healing in His wings. Those little lives that's hid like the sap in the tree in the ground. Like the, the life that's in the seed of the flower. It'll bring it forth to newness again. Never to fade. Oh, how we thank you for this. And there was many, many hands that went up this morning. For they know that beyond the veil there, there's something they long to see mother. They long to see their loved ones and their acquaintance and find out all these mysteries, how they come here and down through the time. It all lays behind the hidden veil. And someday you're coming and they raise their hands. They, 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 they want to be sure, Lord. They're renewing themselves again and so am I. So am I. Now help us, Lord. Renew our faith and our strength. And as we feel the approaching of the Lord, and the last 40 years that broke forth a new Pentecost upon the earth, the Spirit began to reveal things. And here we are at the last sign just before the coming. We know the approaching of the Lord is close to and we see the sick being made well from their sickness, which has been mysterious to the world for 2,000 years since the apostles. But here it is appearing again. Prophets are rising. Angels are appearing. Signs and wonders. What is it? The resurrection's drawing nigh. The S O N is coming. Let us be ready, Lord. 
Let us embrace every divine promise. Don't think about these little knots that's been accumulated by science and so forth that it can't happen. Let them begin to unravel this morning by the immortal faith. As he vibrates across the words of God's Bible like a well-tuned instrument to sing the rhythm, I am he that was dead and is alive forevermore. A little while and the world sees me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Amen. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, thou pour out my spirit upon all flesh, signs and wonders. The old man will dream dreams, and the young man shall see visions. Amen. The sign of the latter rain in the end time. Let it be felt among us this morning, Lord, and may our faith be secured. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.